until 7 for this one, right? And then we have the reception upstairs? Okay, ish, ish, yeah, okay. No, that sounds great. Yeah, no, exactly, that's the idea. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Oshira Memorial Lecture. Uh, thanks for coming on such a beautiful evening. Really, what are you doing here? It's gorgeous outside. Uh, before you think better of it, uh, we better jump in, right? So we're, we're honored to be joined you know, this evening by a distinguished speaker who will be introduced shortly. It's my happy duty, though, to introduce the introducer um, and to thank you all again for your ongoing support of the Oshira Workshop. It's been quite a week uh, with the dedication of the historical marker on Monday, which was such a wonderful event. Um, and uh, this evening, of course, a great research speaker series uh, with Mark here during the lunch hour. And it's World Commons Week, so the fun continues. So if you haven't checked out any of those webinars, they're really great. There's one in Asia, for example, starting in about five hours. So it's, it's around the clock, 55 events, which is just wonderful. Um, so do check those out as well. But this evening, we really have a stellar uh, event for you. Um, and to tell you a bit more about it, I'm happy to introduce our director of our Data Information Governance Program, Angie Raymond, uh, professor over at the Kelly School of Business and a world-renowned, I'd say galaxy-renowned, because why not, uh, scholar in, uh, in, in AI governance, um, smart contracts, uh, you name it. So thank you so much for organizing this, Angie, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, hello, and welcome to the sixth annual Eleanor Ostrom Memorial Lecture. As Scott said, my name is Angie Raymond, and I'm the Director of Data Management and Information Governance at the Ostrom Workshop. On the 10th anniversary of Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize, it's wonderful for us not only to consider the impact and influence of her scholarship, but to also consider new areas in which her scholarship can extend. Areas such as the internet and information governance present interesting challenges that we would be remiss if we did not consider such influential work as providing frameworks for exploration of our digital lives. As this year's Ostrom Memorial Lecture, Doc Searles will explain, the internet is a worldwide commons without model or precedent in human history or experience. And now it is being closely enclosed by corporate and government giants and by our own mental models. In this important timely topic, Doc will explore how and why this enclosure is happening 
and the risks to all the commons the internet supports and what we can do to keep it free and open. As you undoubtedly know, Doc Searles is a veteran journalist, widely read author, pioneering blogger, and oft, often quoted opponent of uninvited tracking of people online. He is a leader in the movement to increase personal agency and privacy online. He, along with his wife, Joyce Searles, founded the Customer Commons, the nonprofit with a mission to restore the balance of power, respect, and trust between individuals and organizations that serve them. Please join me in welcoming Doc Searles delivering his 2019 Oster Memorial Lecture entitled Saving the Internet and All the Commons It Makes Possible. Thanks, Scott and Angie and everybody uh, uh, for showing up. Uh, who here has seen or knows about the movie Blade Runner, which came out? They said all but all but a few. Can anybody tell me when in the future from 1982 it was set? You're nodding. You know. 2019. As a matter of fact, the first things to appear on screen are Los Angeles. November 2019, and um, so it's like, if my math is right, like 23 days from now. So uh, in, in Blade Runner's uh, 2019, Los Angeles is this dark and rainy hellscape with buildings the size of mountains, flying cars and human replicants working on off-world colonies. Uh, it also has pay phones and, low, and low-def computer screens that have vacuum tubes. So uh, missing in that, is a communication system that can put everyone in the world at zero distance from everyone else uh, in disembodied form at almost no cost. A system that lives on little slabs in everybody's pockets and purses and on laptop computers far more powerful than anything that was around in 1982. In other words, this, computer, this communication system, the internet, was less thinkable in 1982 than flying cars, replicants, and off-world colonies. And if we rewind to the world of 1982 and the future internet uh, that would appear, you know, it would appear as a miracle dwarfing that of loaves and fish. In economic terms, the internet is a common pool resource, but non-rivalrous and non-excludable to such an extreme that to call it a pool or a resource is to insult what makes it common. That is, that it is the simplest possible way for anyone and anything in the world to, to be present with anyone and anything else in the, world, in the world at a cost that rounds to zero. As a commons, the internet encircles every person, every institution, every business, every university, every government, and everything you can name. It is no less exha exhaustible than presence itself. And by nature and design, it can't be tragic any more than the universe can be tragic. There is also only one of it. As with the universe, it has no other examples. As a source of abundance, the internet's closest equal is the periodic table, and it may be even more elemental than that, so elemental, in fact, that it is, it is easy to overlook the simple fact that, the, that it is the largest goose that ever, uh, ever to lay golden eggs. It can, however, be misunderstood, and that's why it's in trouble. The trouble it's in is with human nature, the one that sees more value in the goose's eggs than in the goose itself. So the goose is in trouble. And because the internet is designed to support every possible institution and, alas, every possible restriction and closure is possible, people, institutions, and possibilities of all kinds can be trapped inside, the enclo inside enclosures on the internet. I'll describe nine of them. I kind of lost count at nine. I thought you guys could stand nine. Um, the first enclosure is service provisioning, for example, with asymmetric connection speeds. On cable connections, for example, you may have up to 400 megabits per second downstream, but only 10 per second upstream, or 1 40th of that. By the way, that's exactly what Spectrum, formerly Time Warner Cable, provides to its most expensive home service tier to customers in New York City. They, they do that to maximize consumption while minimizes, pr, minimizing production by those customers. That way you can consume all the video you want on the TV model and think you're getting great service, but meanwhile, it prevents production at your end. 
You want to put out a broadcast or a podcast from your house, uh, to run your own email server, to store your own video or other personal data in the cloud even, forget it. The internet was designed to support infinite production by anybody of anything, but cable TV companies don't want you to have that power, so you don't. The home internet you get from your cable company is nice to have, but it's not the whole internet. It's an enclosed subset of capabilities biased by and for the cable company. So it's golden eggs for them, but none for you. Also missing are the golden eggs you might make possible for those companies as an active producer, a partner even, than as a passive consumer. The second enclosure is through 5G wireless services. We're seeing a lot of that advertised now. Currently promoted, of course, by the phone companies as a new generation of internet service. The companies deploying 5G promise greater speeds and lower lag times over wireless connections, but it's also clear that they want to build in as many choke points as they like, all so you can be billed in as many ways as possible for as many things as possible. You want gaming, here's your gaming package. You want cloud storage, here's your cloud storage package. Each of these uses will carry terms and conditions that allow some users and some uses and prevent others. Again, this is a phone company enclosure, not a cable company enclosure. No cable companies are employing, uh, deploying 5G. They're fine with their enclosure. So we're talking about two different enclosures here. The third enclosure is government censorship. The most familiar of these is China's. In, China, in China's closed internet, you will find no Google, no Facebook, no Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit, no Pandora, no Spotify, no Slack, no Dropbox. What you will find is pervasive surveillance of everybody and everything, and ranking of people by something that's called social credit. Last year, China punished 23 million people with low social credit scores by banning them from traveling. Control of speech has also spread just recently, like in the news now, to US companies such as the NBA and ESPN, which are now censoring themselves as well, bowing to the wishes of the Chinese government and its own captive business partners. The fourth enclosure is the advertising-supported commercial internet. This is led by Google and Facebook, obviously, but also includes all the websites and services that depend on tracking-based advertising, which, by the way, is pretty much all of them at this point. This form of advertising, known as ad tech in the business, has in the last decade become pretty much the only kind of advertising online. Today, there are very few major websites that don't participate in what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism and Brett Frischman and Evan Selinger call re-engineering humanity, two books I highly recommend getting and reading. Dependence on surveillance capitalism online is now so deep and so complete that nearly every news organization is either unaware of it or afraid to talk about it and report on it. You'll read endless stories about how bad Facebook and Google are and how awful it is that we're all being tracked everywhere like marked animals, but very little about how the sites publishing stories about tracking participate in exactly the same business and far more surreptitiously. Reporting on their own involvement in the surveillance business is a third rail they won't grab. I know of only one magazine that took and shook that third rail, especially in the last year and a half. That magazine was Linux Journal, where I worked for 24 years and served as editor-in-chief when it was finally killed by its owner in August. Um, and at least indirectly, that was because we didn't participate in the surveillance economy. We were still viable, by the way. The fifth enclosure, ironically, is consumer protection, most notably in Europe. There your privacy is protected by laws meant to restrict personal data use by companies online. As a result in Europe, you won't see the Los Angeles Times or the Washington Post and many other publishers on your browsers because those publishers don't want to cope with what's required of them by, UC, by the EU's privacy laws. Now, while they're at least partly to blame for this because they wish to remain in the reader tracking business, the laws themselves are terribly flawed. For example, by urging every website, and you'll be very familiar with this, 
by urging every website to put up a cookie notice on pages greeting readers, in most cases clicking accept to those sites' cookies, only gives the site permission to continue doing exactly the kind of tracking the laws were meant to prevent. An unintended consequence there. Well, they are partly to blame, no, I'm sorry. So while the purpose of these laws is, is to make the internet safer, in effect, they also make it smaller. It's useful space smaller. The sixth enclosure, I'm gonna run out of fingers almost. The sixth enclosure is what The Guardian calls digital colonialism. The biggest example of that is Facebook.org, previously branded Free Basics and Internet.org to fake you out, that was the idea. This is a subset of the internet offered for free by Facebook in the less developed parts of the world. It consists of a fully enclosed web, only a few dozen sites wide, each handpicked by Facebook, and the rest of the internet isn't there. The seventh enclosure is the forgotten past. You're not going to read much about this. I've just been researching it myself recently. Today, the World Wide Web, which began as a kind of growing archive, a public, a published, a public set of published goods we could browse as if it were a library, is being lost, forgotten. And that's because search engines today are increasingly biased to index and find pages from the present and the recent past. It's forgetting what's old. Archival goods are starting to disappear like snow on the water. Why? Ask the algorithm. Of course, you can't. By design, that brings us to our eighth enclosure, which is algorithmic opacity. Consider for a moment how important power plants are and how carefully governed they are as well. By, and, you know, there's government agents that go out in their white coats and the rest and investigate every solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, and fossil fuel power production system in the world. They're all subject to inspection by these people. Whole classes of degreed uh, and trained professionals work on that stuff. There is no such thing for the giant search engine and social networks of the world. Google and Facebook both operate dozens of data centers, each the size of many Walmart stores, yet the inner workings of those data centers are nearly absent of government oversight. This owes partly to the speed of change than what these centers do, but more to the simple fact that they are unknowable by design. You can't look at rows of computers with blinking lights in many acres of racks and have the first idea of what's going on there. I would love to see research, for example, on that last enclosure I listed about how well search engines continue to index old websites or to do anything. The whole business is as opaque as a bowling ball with no holes. I'm not even sure you can find anyone at Google who can explain exactly why, what it, why its index does one thing or another for any one person or another. In fact, I doubt Facebook is even capable of explaining why any given individual sees any given ad. They aren't designed for that. And the algorithm itself isn't designed to fully explain itself, perhaps even to the employees responsible for it. Or so I suppose. In the internet of, in the internet of moving forward, with, in the interest, I'm sorry, of moving forward with research on these topics, I invite anyone at Google, Facebook, Bing, or Amazon to come forward to researchers at institutions such as the Ostrom Workshop and explain exactly what's going on inside their systems and to provide testable and verifiable ways to research those goings on. The ninth and worst enclosure is the one inside our own heads. Because if we think the internet as most of us do, is something we get by grace of Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and providers such as phone and cable companies, we're helping all those companies contain the internet's usefulness inside their walled gardens. So not understanding the internet can result in problems similar to ones we suffer by not understanding common pool resources such as the atmosphere, the oceans, and the earth itself. But there's a difference between common pool resources in the natural world and the uncommon commons that we have with the internet. Because while we know that common pool resources are in fact not limitless, even when they seem that way, we don't have the same knowledge of the internet because its nature as a limitless non-thing is non-obvious. 
For example, we know common pool resources in the natural world risk tragic outcomes if our use of them is ungoverned, either by good sense or governance systems with global reach. But we don't know that the, inter that the internet is limitless by design or that the only thing potentially tragic about it is how we restrict access to it and use of it by enclosures such as the nine I just listed, or most of us don't know. So my thesis here is this, if we can deeply and fully understand what the internet is, why it is fully important and why it is in danger of enclosure, we can also understand why 10 years after Lynn Ostrom won a Nobel Prize for her work on the commons, that work may be exactly what we need to save the internet as a boundless commons that can support, support countless others. So let's look a little more closely to what the internet actually is. What, we'll begin with what makes the internet possible in the beginning, which is a protocol. A protocol is a code of etiquette for diplomatic exchanges between computers over a network. It's a form of a handshake. What the internet's protocol does is give all the world's digital devices and networks a handshake agreement about how to share data between any point A and any point B in the world over any intermediary networks. When you send an email, or look at a website anywhere in the world, the route the shared data takes can run through any number of networks between the two. You might connect from Bloomington to Denver through Chicago, uh, or, or Tokyo, and then Tokyo in Mexico City, then two minutes later through Toronto and Miami. Some packets within your data flows may be dropped or lost along the way, but the whole system will work just fine because the errors get noticed and the data resent and reassembled on the fly. Oddly, none of this is especially complicated at the technical level because what I just described is pretty much all the internet does. It doesn't concern itself with what's inside the traffic that it routes, who is at the ends of the connections, or what their purposes are any more than gravity cares about what it attracts. Beyond the sunk costs of its physical infrastructure and the operational costs of keeping the networks themselves standing up, the internet has no first costs at its protocol level where it matters and adds up to no cost along the way. It adds no cost along the way. It also has no billing system. In all these ways, the internet is literally neutral. It also doesn't need regulators or lawmakers to make it neutral. That's just its nature. The internet's protocol is called TCP IP, and by using it, all the networks of the world subordinate their own selfish interests. subordinate their own selfish purposes, excuse me. This is what makes the internet's protocol generous and supportive to an absolute degree toward every purpose to which it's put. It is a rising tide that lifts all boats. In retrospect, we might say that the big networks within the internet, those run by phone and cable companies, governments, and universities, agreed to participate in the internet because it was so obviously useful that there was no reason not to. But the rising tide-like nature of the internet was not obvious to them at first. In retrospect, they didn't realize that the internet was a Trojan horse wheeled through their gates by geeks who looked harmless but in fact were bringing the world a technological miracle. I could support that claim by noting that even though phone and cable companies of the world now make trillions of dollars because of the internet, they never would have invented it. And there are two reasons for that. One was because it was because it was too damn simple. The other is because they would have started with billing, and not just billing you and me. They would have wanted to bill each other and use something and never use something that was already invented by some other company. A measure of the internet's miraculous nature in this respect, um, uh, I miss, yeah, it's is that actually billing each other would have been so costly and so complicated that what they do with each other, this is what they actually do with each other, to facilitate moving data to, from, and across all these networks is called peering. In other words, they charge each other nothing. <laughs> they share that data without, without any billing whatsoever to each other. Again, all TCP IP says is this is a way for computers, networks, and everything connected to them to get along. And it succeeded producing instant worldwide peace among otherwise competing providers and services. It made every network operator involved win a vast positive sum game. None of them knew they were playing, and most of them, frankly, still don't. 
You know that old joke in which the big fish says to the little fish, hi guys, how's the water? And one of the little fish says to the other, what's water? Um, in 2005, David Foster Wallace gave a legendary commencement address at Kenyon College that I highly recommend, titled, This is Water. I suspect that if Wallace were around today, he'd address that point to our digital world. Those of you who already know me are aware that my wife Joyce, that's her right there, um, is as much a companion and collaborator as Vincent uh, was of Lynn. And I bring this up because much of this talk is hers, including the pair of insights about the internet, this, this pair of insights about the internet, which is that it has no distance and also no gravity. I should also add, there are many points that I'm not making that she had me cut out for length reasons. So she's my editor as well. Um, but no distance and no gravity. These are original with her. Um, so think about it. When you're on the internet with another person, for example, when you're in a chat or in an online conference, there's no functional distance between you and the other person. One of you may be in Chicago and the other in Bangalore, but the internet is working and distance is gone. Gravity is also gone. You may, your face may be right side up on the other person's screen, but it is absent of gravity. The space you both occupy in the, it is the other person's two-dimensional rectangle. Um, even when we come up with holographic representations of ourselves, which I suppose is inevitable, we will still be incorporeal on the internet. Familiar as this disembodied state may be to all of us, it is still new to human experience and inadequately informed by our experience as embodied creatures. It is also hard for us to see both what our limitations are and how limitless we are at the same time. Joyce points out that we are also highly adaptive creatures, however, meaning that eventually we'll figure this out. We'll know what it means to live where there's no distance or gravity, much as astronauts learn to live uh, as weightless beings in space. But in the meantime, the internet is still young and we're having a hard time seeing the nature and limits of what's good and what's bad in this new environment. And that has to do at least in part on forms of enclosure in this world and how we're exploited within private spaces in which we hardly know we're trapped. In the medium is the massage, not the medium is a message, that was an earlier point. Um, Marsha McLuhan says every new medium, every new technology, works us over completely. That's his line, works us over completely. Such as now with digital technology and the internet, which he never lived to see. I was talking recently with a friend uh, about this, about where our current digital transition, and a lot of people call it that, the digital transition ranks among all the other technological transitions um, in history. Um, you know, was becoming digital the biggest thing since the Industrial Revolution or since television or radio? Um, was it the biggest thing since movable type or writing itself or speech? No, he said, it's the biggest thing since oxygenation. In case you weren't there or you weren't paying attention in geology class, oxygenation happened about two and a half billion years ago, uh, which brings me to our next topic, um, which is institutions. Um, journalism is one sample of a trusted institution that is highly troubled in the digital world. It worked fine in the physical world where truth tellers who dig into topics and report on them with minimized prejudice were relatively scarce yet easy to find and to trust. But in a world flooded with information and opinion, a world where everybody can be a reporter, a publisher, a producer, um, a broadcaster, where the news cycle has the lifespan of a joke, and where news and gossip have become almost indistinguishable while being routed algorithmically to amplify prejudice and homophily, journalism has become an anachronism almost, still important, but all but drowning in a flood of biased content paid for by surveillance-led ad tech. Again, that's uh, tracking-based advertising. People are still hungry for good information, of course, but our appetites are too easily fed by browsing through the surfeit of content on the internet which we can easily share by text, email, and social media. Even if we do our best, the best we can, to share trustworthy facts and other substances that sound like truth, we remain suspended in a techno-social environment. We mostly generate and regenerate ourselves, kind of like our ancestral life forms made sense of the seas they oxygenated long ago. The academy is yet another institution that is troubled in our digital time. After all, education on the internet is easy to find. Good educational materials are easy to produce and share. For example, take Khan Academy, which a lot of us know, especially with kids. Um, authority, however, must still be earned, uh, but there are now countless non-institutional ways to earn it. 
credentials still matter, but less than they used to, and not in the same ways, and not in all the disciplines. Also in ways that are cheap, where institutions of higher education remain very expensive. So what happens when the market for knowledge and know-how starts moving past requirements for advanced degrees that take students nearly half their adult life to pay off? One example of that risk is already at work with computer programming. Which do you think matters more to a potential employer of, of computer programmers? A degree in computer science or a short but productive track record as a programmer? For example, by contributing code to the Linux operating system. To put this in perspective, Linux and operating systems like it, which are the ones in Macintosh and many others, um, other ones like it, ins are inside nearly everything smart that connects to the internet, including TVs, door locks, the world's search engines, social networks, laptops, mobile phones. Nothing could be more essential to computing life. At the heart of Linux is what's called the kernel. For code to get into the kernel, it has to pass muster with other programmers who have already pro proven their worth, and then through testing and debugging. If you're looking for a terrific programmer, everyone contributing to the Linux kernel is well proven, and there are thousands of them. Now, here's the thing. It not only doesn't matter whether or not these people have degrees in computer science, or even if they've had any formal training, what matters for our purposes here is that to a remarkable degree, many of them don't have either, or perhaps most of them don't have either. And I know a little bit about this because in the course of my work at Linux Journal, I would sometimes ask groups of alpha Linux programmers where they learned to code. Almost none of them told me school. Most were self-taught or learned from each other. My point here is that the degree to which the world's most essential and consequential operating system depends on formal education of its makers rounds to roughly zero. However, the Linux kernel mailing list, which is where all these programmers submit their patches to the kernel, is a commons. <laughs> it's a very productive commons. See, the problem for educational institutions now in the digital world is that most are built to leverage scarcity, scarce authority, scarce materials, scarce workspace, scarce time, scarce credentials, scarce reputation, scarce anchors of trust. To a highly functional degree, we still need and depend on what only educational institutions can provide. But that degree is a lot lower than it used to be and a lot more varied among the disciplines and risks continuing to decline as time goes on. So it might help at this point to see gravity in some ways as the problem the internet solves because gravity is top down. It fosters hierarchy and bell curves, sometimes where we need neither of those. Absence of gravity instead fosters higher heterarchy. The absence of gravity, for example, on the internet fosters heterarchy and polycentrism and as we know, the Ostrom Workshop perhaps knows perhaps better than anyone that commons are good examples of heterarchy and especially polycentrism at work. Now, in 2007, Eleanor Ostrom and Charlotte Hess, already operating in our new digital age, extended the commons category to include knowledge, calling it a complex ecosystem that operates as a common, a shared resource of rivalrous and excludable goods. They looked at ease of access to digital forms of knowledge and easy new ways to store access and share knowledge as a common. They also looked at the nature of knowledge and its qualities of non-rivalry and non-excludability, -exclu which are both unlike what characterizes a natural commons with its scarcities of rivalrous and excludable goods. A knowledge commons, they said, is characterized by abundance. This is one way that Yokai Benkler, uh, uh, that uh, calls commons-based peer, peer production on the internet is both easy and rampant, giving us, among many other things, both the free software and open source movements in code development and sharing, plus the internet itself and the web on top of that. Commons-based peer production also demonstrates how collaboration and non-material incentives can produce better quality products and less social friction in the course of production. Now, given Linux is one example of commons-based peer production, others are Wikipedia and the Internet Archive. We're also seeing it within the academy, for example, with Indiana University's own open archives making research more accessible and scholarship more rich and productive. Every one of those examples, and there aren't enough of them, by the way, comports with Lynn Ostrom's design principles, clearly defined group boundaries, rules governing use of common goods within local needs and conditions, participation in modifying rules by those affected, 
accessible and low-cost ways to resolve disputes, de developing a system carried out by community members for monitoring members' behavior, graduated sanctions for rule violators and governing responsibility in nested tiers from the lowest level to the entire in interconnected system. There was your Nobel Prize there. Um, but there is also a, a crisis within commons-based peer production as well. And this is one I know too much about, again, with my work with Linux Journal. Programmers who 10 years ago or 15 years ago would not participate in enclosing their own environments are doing exactly that, for example, with 5G, which is designed to put the phone companies in charge of what we can do on the internet and operate not a commons but their own little closed system. The 5G enclosed internet might end up being faster and more handy in many ways, and there, but the range of freedoms for each of us there will be bounded by the commercial interests of the phone companies and their partners and subject to none of Lynn's rules for governing a commons. Consider this, every one of the nine enclosures I listed at the beginning of this talk are enabled by programmers who, every one of them, have been enabled by programmers who uh, either forgot or never learned about the freedom and openness that made the free and open internet possible. They, they are employed instead in the golden egg gathering business, not in one that appreciates the goose that laid, lays those eggs in which, which their predecessors gave to us all. But it's not the end of the world, we're still at the beginning, and a good model for how to begin is the physical world. It's significant that all the commons that the Ostroms and their colleagues researched in depth were local. Their work established beyond any doubt the importance of local knowledge and local control. I believe demonstrating this in the digital world is our best chance for saving our digital world from the nine forms of enclosure I listed earlier. It's our best chance because there is no substitute for reality. We may be digital beings now as well as physical ones. There are great advantages even in the digital world to operating in the here and now physical world where our predest prepositions still work and our metaphors still apply. And I cut out the section on prepositions and metaphors, by the way. So in the q and I could explain that if you want. And back to Joyce again. In the mid-90s, when the internet was still freshly min manifest in our home computers, I was mansplaining to her about how this internet thing was finally the global village that was long promised by tech. Her response was, the sweet spot of the internet is still local. She said that because local is where the physical and the virtual intersect. It's where you can't fake reality because you can see, feel, and shake hands with it. She also said the first thing the internet would obsolesce would be classified ads in newspapers. And that would be because the internet would be a better place than classifieds for parents to find a crib some neighbor down the street might have for sale. Then Craigslist came along and did exactly that. We have it, you know, so we had an instructive experience in the real world and the, uh, excuse me, I had an instructive experience in how the real world and the inter internet worked together helpfully at the local level about a year and a half ago. That's when a giant rainstorm fell on the mountains behind Santa Barbara where we live and the town next door called Montecito. Um, and, and this is also right after a wildfire had burned all the vegetation away. It was the biggest wildfire in California history until the one a few months later. Um, and and that, <laughs> this weather's shutting off electricity in California now, because uh, it turned out the power company did that. Anyway, um, so the risk there was what's called a debris flow. When there's no vegetation on the mountainside, the rain comes, debris flows. And, and that was at its maximum. So the result was, the biggest debris flow in the history of the region, a flash flood of rock and mud that flowed across Montecito like lava from a volcano. Nearly 200 homes were destroyed and 23 people were killed. Two of them were never found because it's hard to find victims buried under what turned out to be at least 20,000 truckloads of boulders and mud. Right afterwards, all of Montecito was evacuated. Very little news got out while emergency and rescue workers did their jobs. Our local news media, in fact, did an excellent job of covering this event as a story, but I noticed not much is being said about the geology involved. So while I was familiar with similar events above Los Angeles, where they have infrastructure that's ready to prevent this kind of thing, I put up a post on my blog titled, Making Sense of What Happened in Montecito. In that post, I shared facts about the geology involved and also published the only list on the web of all the addresses of all the homes that had been destroyed. Visits to my blog jumped from dozens a day to dozens of thousands. Lots of readers also helped improve what I wrote and rewrote. It's a nice thing on the web. You can rewrite what's there. 
All of this happened over the internet, but it pertained to a real world crisis. Now here's the thing, what I did wasn't writing a story, I didn't do it for the money, and my blog is a non-commercial one anyway. I did it to help my neighbors. I did it by not being a bystander. I also did it in the context of a knowledge commons. Specifically, I was respectful of boundaries of responsibility, notably those of local authorities, rescue workers, law enforcement, reporters from local media, city and county workers preparing reports, and so on. I gave much credit where it was due and didn't step on the toes of others helping out as well. An interesting fact about journalism there at the time was the complete absence of fake news, I mean truly fake news. Sure, there was plenty of finger pointing and in blog comments and in social media, not as much as you'd expect, but of course there were some. But it was marginalized away from the fact reporting that mattered most to people. There really was a very productive ecosystem of information made possible by the internet in everyone's midst and by everyone, and by that I mean lots of very different people. And part of what makes us different, another part I cut out, <laughs> is that we're learning creatures by nature. We can't help it. We do that uh, and we don't do it by freight forwarding. This is how we t tend to describe information. By that I mean what I'm doing here and what we do with each other when we talk or teach is not delivering a commodity called information as if we were forwarding freight. Something much more transformational is in fact taking place. And this is profoundly relevant to the knowledge commons that we share. Consider the word information here. It's a noun derived from the verb to inform, which is in turn derived from the verb to form. You tell, when you tell me something I don't know, you don't just deliver a sum of information to me, you form me. I, as a walking sum of all I, all I know, I'm changed by that, I'm not the same. This means we are all authors of each other. In that sense, the word authority belongs to the right we give others to author us, to form us. Now look at how much more of that can happen on our planet thanks to the internet and its absence of distance and gravity. And think about what changes every commons we participate in as both physical and digital beings and how much we need guidance to keep from screwing up the commons we have or forming the ones we don't, or forming the ones we might have in the future. A rule in technology is that what can be done will be done until we find out what shouldn't be done. As humans, we've done this with every new technology uh, and practice from speech to stone tools to nuclear power. We're there now with the internet. In fact, many of the enclosures I listed are well-intended efforts to limit dangerous uses of the internet. And now we are at the point where some of those too are in danger. What might, what might be the best way to look at the internet and its uses most sensibly? I suggest the answer is governance predicated on the realization that the internet is perhaps the ultimate commons and subject to both research and guidance informed by Lynn Ostrom's rules. And I hope that guides our study. Um, there's so much to work on, expansion of agency, sensibility around license and copyright, freedom to benefit individuals and society alike, protections that don't foreclose opportunity, um, uh, uh, saving informative journalism, um, reimagining the academy, creating and sharing wealth without victims, definancializing our economies. The list is very long, and I look forward to working with many of us here on answers to those and many other questions. Thank you. There you go. And here's the magic mic. There you go. Question. <laughs> Water. Water. Yeah. <laughs> the faculty has questions. <laughs> and then in the back, I don't want to miss the back either. Oh, boy. Oh. I, well, I, I actually saw Scott and Barb first, but we'll let you go first. I'm on the way up. You're stuck with me now. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it seems like you started with describing the internet as a sort of common, accessible to everybody medium, and then the division into those enclosed domains started to develop. Yeah, can you talk just a little slower? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, it seems like you started with uh, describing the original internet as something that's common and accessible to everybody, 
and then only later was it divided into separate enclosed domains. But surely from the very beginning of computer network, most of the original computer network were basically corporate networks like, say, or government networks like ARPANET, or corporate networks like Minitel, or if you wish, um, uh, like sub subscription networks like, say, what was it, CompuServe, and so on. Or hobbyist networks like, I forget the name, FidoNet, for example, or BBS. You know, I'm sure you remember BBS because you were about as old as yeah. me. Yeah, so really, the in, ubiquitous, uh, unified, undivided internet is a comparatively recent comer here, I would say. So, so I think I understood most of what you said. Uh, I, Joyce was very eager to have me point out, first of all, that um, half the world is still unserved by the internet. So that may or may not address one of your points. Um, I think that's a big, a big consideration. Um, there are plenty of networks that. Uh, are within the network, uh, within the internet, or, or, or aside from the internet network. The key thing about TCP/IP, the miraculous thing about TCP/IP, is it did bring them all together. It brought, the, it made all of them interact with each other. If we wanted them to interact, um, there are there are lots of restrictions on ways to use the internet. I mean, Joyce and I found we couldn't send email, to, you know, from the hotel here. Um, you know, the security is another important consideration. And it's another, you know, example of how we have to be responsible about these things. But the key thing about, you know, the, my key point here is that we, we can understand, you know, we understood CompuServe, we understood AOL, we understand all of the, um, the essentially closed um, uh, standalone networks in the world. I think we understand the advantages of, of wireless, and we understand the advantages of fiber and a lot of these other considerations, while missing what it is, this miraculous thing that is available to us all that's underneath it and that we miss. And that's really where, where I'm pointing, because I think if we bring our understanding of the commons to what we do on top of that, we're going to do a better job of deploying those separate parts of the internet. Does that help? Does that address some of what you're... You shrug your shoulders. Well, doing my best. Okay, so Barb and Scott. Hi, Doc. Um, I wanted to ask Barb something for answers, of by the way, what so. you said earlier um, <laughs> in your talk when you were talking about how the protocol itself gives all computers a handshake and that it, it that in of itself does not involve a cost. But you did refer to the initial infrastructure, physical yeah. infrastructure of the the challenge is, is that even the internet, the use of a protocol presupposes or conditioned on the fact that you do have an infrastructure already in place that can use it. Yeah. Okay, you already have to have the computers and you have to have the conduits, whether it's wires or wireless or whatever. And how do we govern that? Yeah. Because that's, we still need that physical dimension of an infrastructure in order to have an internet commons. Yeah. And we still need to deal with the governance of that. And then it seems to me that's a key part of where these other companies and powers come in, where they have the power to enclose. Yeah. Because they are providing that infrastructure. So how do we bridge insights of Ostrom's work with regard to <laughs> the internet protocol itself for the infrastructure portion itself. And that's where we have the additional governance yeah. issues. It, it's a tough one. I, um, uh, I'm mentioning 5G. I'm still learning about 5G. And um, that's one of those infrastructures that's being built out right now uh, and where the claims far exceed whatever. I mean, there's so much disagreement about where that goes. Um, but when I, when I went to the Linux Foundation's um, uh, cloud, what was the summit? The cloud something summit. Uh, I I felt like Obi Wan visiting the the planet where they make the clones, you know, in in one of those early uh, Star Wars movies where you know we've got the clones ready for you. They're ready to go to war, um, uh, and and it was like, d do they know what they're doing? Because it's like. It's not the internet. It, it looks like the internet. It sounds like the internet. It's supposed to be the internet. But it's not a commons. It belongs to the phone company even more than, than you know, the, what we have on cable belongs to the cable company and what we get on, on, on our 
mobile phones belongs to the phone company. It's much more locked down, potentially locked down and controlled. And I worry about that because that's that's infrastructure. I, I worry about how we uh, how we bring the internet to rural areas uh, and and what's you know. And I think it's an open question. What's the what's the commons based wisdom we bring to that? You know, how do we go, for example, to the wireless internet service providers, the WISPs of the world, which tend to be, you know, you know, libertarian Republicans in 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 rural Nebraska, you know, that are that you know, know a whole lot about working around the systems that are there and deploying it, but I don't know to what extent they're bringing commons-based uh, sensibilities to it. They, I think, you know, there's a lot of argument, and you and I have heard and been involved in a lot of these um, around um, how you bring fiber out. You know, what our friend Elliot Noss is doing with, 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 with Ting, for example, uh, is very different from what the Nulties did with, with, in Vermont for very different reasons. And, and both of them care a great deal about doing the right thing, right? Um, but if they were in the same room here, they'd be giving us two different answers and, and arguing about it. And my guess is that you'll have the better question for both of them. So uh, Scott, and then over here. Oh, you want to go here and then to Scott? We'll save Scott. So thank you very much. <clears throat> I have two points, one more general and then one specific. The general one is a, bit, a little bit about rhetoric. So um, about rhetoric. Oh, okay. So I really had some difficulties to disentangle in both your address today and on Monday your positive analysis from your value judgments, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's a virtue to keep them apart. Um, I really, I mean, of course, you okay, want to keep value judgments in what apart from your normative, or from sorry, from from your positive analysis, like the description from the judgment. Okay. So of course you're an activist and you fight for the right cause. I agree about that, but. Again, I was having some difficulties to hold your opinion from your analysis apart. Mm. Like more, my specific question is, so as I read Lynn Ostrom, it's not only about commons, but it's also about the coexistence of commons, private enterprises, and the government. And since I live in Europe, I've grown a little bit tired of the bashing of the big tech companies and the bad business models which they have. I mean, I think, the commons as we have them in the internet have to coexist as we just heard also with the companies who provide infrastructure and it costs tons of money, the energy uh, for setting up ah, that whole system. Um, and also companies I think like Google or Facebook provide gigantically great services, very egalitarian, so the whole world. Forgive me, my, my daughter, the college professor, is calling me on my phone and I was trying to shut it off. And it's just, no, no, no worries. I, I've succeeded, sorry. <laughs> so my point is also those companies, first of all, they have the costs, so they have to cover them. You said you wrote your blog just for free. Well, probably you do your living on a different basis. They do their living by providing those services, which you we use for free. I mean, of course, we pay with our data. I understand that. Yeah. I would dispute that, by the way. I don't think we pay with our data. I, think, I also I, don't I think buy... It's not I, think it's less, I think it's less transactional. I that. also don't buy the analogy quite well, but that's how we... So I just wanted to encourage you, I mean, to say, well, yes, they track us. Yes, they fund themselves largely by advertisements, but they need the money to run those businesses, and those businesses make the world, apart from like our part of the world, I would say a more egalitarian place. You don't have libraries in Africa, but now you have access to Google Books uh, or to Google News, so you're not as exposed to, let's say, authoritarian regimes around who have the local newspaper. So I think, and all that for free. I wouldn't just, just wanted to make the point that we shouldn't bash them on the general basis as we common, commonly do. Okay, points taken. <laughs> I went, I went, I, I, and I should, I should add, by the way, I, I would not at all want to um, claim to be an Ostrom scholar. I've read all I can in the last few months, but there's a lot. And there are people who I know that are much more scholarly than me on this. Like, it's a Brett, good friend of Barb's and mine and Joyce's uh, is Brett Frischman. Uh, and, you know, his book on the knowledge commons is massive and good and uh, reengineering humanity and the others. So um, I, I defer to others on that one. I want to make, I want to make clear. Scott. Thank you so much, and I really enjoyed really enjoyed the discussion here and the great questions. 
Um, and I, I also appreciate in particular your efforts to not just talk about, you know, open versus closed, but all the different ways in which cyberspace is being enclosed. Oftentimes, it, that discussion more or less stops with, you know, the great firewall and discussions about Belt and Road and things like that. So a lot more nuance, which I really appreciated there. Um, and I think it actually builds pretty well on, for example, Milton's talk last year about sovereignty and our failure really to still define sovereignty in cyberspace. You know, but my question is, you know, one part and parcel to kind of Stefan's point there of, of Lynn and Vincent's work and many others as well, is that, um, and as you said, you know, local governance in a lot of contexts works pretty well if there's certain parameters in place. And I'm wondering, could there be any flip side here, you know, with the growth of all of these closed networks, if we have, you know, uh, more and more communities that can have some capacity to self-organize? Is it just a matter of holding those curators accountable and establishing mechanisms to hold them more accountable? Um, uh, and is, is there, if that's the case, is there some purview here to, you know, use the, their, their findings uh, in a way that maybe have we have, you know, missed so far in our knee-jerk reactions to, you know, the growth of uh, networks like Facebook? Um, maybe it's too big. Maybe we just need to break them up and start with lots more smaller communities. But I'd welcome your thoughts on how you see and whether we can self-organize our way out of some of these messes. You know, I... Um I was thinking of uh, looking at communities I know, um, some of which I've been in, not just involved with, but have created uh, with very different degrees of success, um, and, uh, and, tr and, and try to run those past uh, Lynn's list of, list of things that characterize a, a working commons. Um, and I, and I, it's a hard one to do. I, you know, I, I think, I mean, it, that list is not box office, you know. It's not as box office as saying leadership, you know, but and you know, or charisma or something else like that. But there are lots of communities that have been created by people with no charisma whatsoever, like like uh, like like Linux. I mean, Linux goes out of his way to be completely blank as a as a personality. Actually, he's been more obvious as a personality lately because he's been busted for some stuff. But um, uh, but it's. It's really hard to generalize. I mean, part of, you know, it's hard to say everything in a talk like this, but part of the everything I would have wanted to say is that, you know, there are the commons that we have and need to understand from. They're the commons we, we don't like that we see happening. And some of those, I think, in respect to what you were saying, may not really be commons. I'm just calling, you know, enclosures or commons in the, in the classical sense of it. Um, but, but matter. You know, and and require discussion and, under, and understanding, um, but there are lots of there are lots of commons that I mean, customer commons, which Joyce and I started. Um, you know, we're imagining a world, we're imagining an economic world um, in which customers, citizens, um, uh, parishioners have far more power uh, than they do now. In part because we're still in the industrial age. We haven't come out of the industrial age yet. There are asymmetry, asymmetries built into the way industry works that are still defaulted, and that we see in companies like Google and Facebook, which, which both started Google far more so, um, with very high-minded aspirations, and then kind of went south or sideways in some other ways that uh, are almost amazingly unself-aware. Uh, could we make them self-aware? I don't know. I mean. I was a huge user of CompuServe, which I think you mentioned earlier back there. Um, we travel all over the world using CompuServe in advance of the internet with, you know, with, with um, alligator clips that we take apart phone connections and, and clip onto there and with our ancient you know, laptops manage to get on CompuServe and pick up faxes in California from France and stuff like that. And I remember as and I saw the internet coming in the 80s and I wanted to tell CompuServe, you guys can get in front of this whole thing. Oh my God, you're already there. You got dial up all over the world. A had no clue, you know. And Steve Case had no clue at AOL either. Um, I, I, you know, and and part of this too is that you know, in respect to these giant companies that provide really good services, um, uh, we lived in Silicon Valley for a long time. We're in Santa Barbara now, but we still go there two weeks out of the year and a lot more. We're going back there after this. This week, as a matter of fact, um, you know, I, you know, my son and I used to play basketball where Google is now in a, in a, 
in a lot that's on a farm that had com you know harvesting machines all over the place. There's a giant farm there. That's all Google's campus. And I can probably, if I think about it, name 10 companies that were there before Google showed up, and will be, and there'll be 10 more after Google's gone. I think, I think it's you know these companies look like projects to me. Apple's an exception, Amazon's a bit of an exception, but they're exceptional because they are dealing with human beings and not with other businesses. Whereas Google, and I know them fairly well, high up people there have told me, we're never gonna deal with ordinary people. We don't like doing that. We're an engineering company, we're a business to business company, and we're in the advertising business. What happens if the advertising business collapses? It might, you know, they still have 65% of their income comes from search advertising, but they're changing search. You know, what if the world changes in a way that indexing all the world's information, which is part of their original purpose, isn't very possible? Or if they just decide we're gonna, you know, we're only gonna index, index now, which is where I think they're headed, and I, I don't, I don't know where that goes. I don't think they know where that goes. So, you know, I don't, I don't know how, I mean, I would love it if we could bring some kind of rule set, you know, to something we say, hey, look, as the comments are starting to emerge here, Here's your rules, folks, you know, follow these and it might happen. I don't know. Um, I, I, I do know we, we need to be on the case, I guess you could say. And the politicians don't know for sure. Yeah, uh, Joyce, uh, Joyce next, if somebody has the microphone. Um, Angie, um, while we're, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, I had a point I was going to make, but I want Joyce to say what she does, and I've already forgotten it. So, um, I was just going to make a point about um, something that you said, actually. Uh, it's true, like, who knows, nobody knows, right? But we have some models in history around things like when electricity was first discovered, it actually went into the private sector. They actually had to go and create... Uh, electri electricity generating stations sort of on every corner in, I don't forget whether it was Detroit or New York City or wherever, but the, the point is is that it started in the private sector. And then once it got to be a big thing, then the private sector, the, the government actually said, this is a public good and we have to we have to control it in a certain way. And I think it's hard to say. We're sort of like, you know, we're just young at this. So it's hard to say how it's going to be. But if we look at the past, it's very possible that it's going to come to pass that it'll be, well, it's a public good that we all need to protect. And that is service that the government gives us. So that's one possible thought about it. Uh, toward your point about politicians, um, uh, a few years ago, and you may have been there, Barb, um, we were, a group of us were talking to a former FCC chairman uh, who said, uh, during a discussion about net neutrality, um, he said, okay, well look, I've spoken to every member of Congress at one time or another, and I can tell you that with very few exceptions, there are two things that none of them understand. One is economics, and the other is technology. Good luck. So that's where we are too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Angie, so I'm gonna, oh, just, oh, just, I, you're just stretching. Back there. I appreciate. It. We're gonna oh. we're gonna move upstairs okay. because we are officially out of time, and I don't want to force people to stay extra long and fight the urge not to walk out as your time expires. We are, however, not ending the conversation. We would very much like to invite you up to join the, re the reception upstairs where they're going to come and you can continue to have these conversations because I'm still intrigued as well. Uh, my hand was up as well. So if you will all please thank Doc very much for giving this wonderful lecture, as well as Joyce. Um, and we're moving upstairs right now. Thank you for everyone who's so. watching.